Welcome to our regular program tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We once again want to salute you in our, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we want to recognize some down links far across the oceans. Japan, Konnichiwa, Philippines, Kumusta, and Indonesia. We want to hear from you. We know you're watching and following this series closely. God bless you abundantly. Send reports through our fax number in Mwanza and email address provided for you on the screen. This coming Sabbath, we will be worshiping together in the hour of worship and the hour of worship will be uplinked for you and for us here. We want to encourage you to join us wherever you may be. Remember, this is the last week for Africa for Christ 2001. You don't want to miss these last moments or events. We want to thank you for sending in encouraging messages every now and then. Then it is a source of strength to many of us who hear what is taking place in every single site. Let me again share with you a very moving experience. One man in a remote area, upon seeing what the power of Africa for Christ event is taking place here, he went out of his way to build a church for believers in that particular community and installed full satellite equipment at his own expense. There are people in this world who know the God whom they're worshiping. There is something in the gospel and they're concerned about it. Pastor Sangi in Arusha, please make close follow up. There could be some people who need baptism in that place. We are praying for you and God bless you. Once again, we want to seek the presence of our God and Master. It is my pleasure to present to you a brother in Christ and fellow servant and minister in the courts of our Lord Jesus Christ, Elder Victor Brown, will lead us to the throne of grace as we rise in reverence. Please stand. Father in heaven, thank you so much for each person that's come here this evening in Mwanza. And Father, thank you for each person that's come in every satellite site in the great continent of Africa and around the world. And Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you have blessed us thus far. And we pray, Father, that you would be with us as we listen this evening, that you'd help us to realize that you are our creator and that you are our sustainer and that you've given us every good gift. And Father, I pray that we would want to serve you because of all of this. And Father, I pray that you would be with the speaker this evening. Be with Dr. Potzer as he opens your word. Help us to be drawn closer to you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
battle for the kingdom. Sin's life he controls. Sin's I gave my heart to Jesus, the Lord.
Amen. Thank you, brother. We were all backstage singing along. That was a great song. Welcome tonight to Christ 2001. We'd like to ask you again to send us your faxes and emails. We're going to put up the fax and the email addresses and numbers during the program tonight. Tonight our special feature is featuring the video productions training seminar that is going on here at the stadium during the daytime and it's really exciting. Tonight we have Pastor Lekawani from the East Africa Division. He is the satellite coordinator. And we welcome you, Pastor. Thank you for being with us. All right, Pastor, tell us a little bit about what the video training is and how many people are involved. Uh, the video training program, its main purpose is to identify lay workers within the Eastern Africa Division, as well as pastors who could be trained in order for them to qualify to uh, uh, proclaim the Adventist message in the context of the multimedia society. Very good. Now, this is quite an extensive program. Who is involved in sponsoring this program and helping coordinate it? The program is uh, co-sponsored by AGCN and Eastern Africa Division. The AGCN is responsible for making, um, for providing the equipment that is needed for the training of these individuals. And uh, AGC, I mean, Eastern Africa Division has made sponsored individuals who have come for the training program. Very good. And there's also some people here from the Pacific Union College uh, from America also that have been actively involved. Um, now tell us, Pastor, what are the objectives of the training? The objectives of the training program are very simple. We want to train these men who are here to enable them to communicate our message in the context of the culture in which we are living. We also want to make sure that we develop manpower in Africa who will eventually support and provide materials that, that will be needed for future programs of AGCN. Mm. Tell us, Pastor, a little bit about where the different students come from. We saw many different diverse students up there. Give us a few of the areas they're coming from. We have students from uh, South Africa Union Conference. We also have uh, students from Eastern Africa Division Territory. We also have uh, students from Af Africa Indian Ocean Division. Okay. Now, the final product, when they get back to their home areas, one more time, give us a little overview of what they'll be able to do with their training. Our ultimate goal when they return after this training is to enable these different entities to, to establish mini media center, which will eventually grow to full-fledged media centers. Great. We would like to share with you at this time the students with the direction of the Pacific Union College and the AGCN and the Eastern Africa Division instructors have been putting their new skills into practice and they have produced a wonderful video for us tonight. We'd like to present that at this time. Thank you. Since the inception of satellite evangelism in 1993, the idea has grown from a North American electronic evangelistic program to a worldwide soul winning venture in the Adventist Church. Many uplink series have since been conducted and thousands of people have been baptized into the Adventist Church. Here at Kirumba Stadium in Mwanza, Tanzania, Evangelist Jerry Patsa has been conducting an uplink series that is being broadcast across Africa, India, and Europe. Coupled with this series is the Adventist World Television Video Producers Seminar, which has drawn participants from the Eastern Africa Division, Africa Indian Ocean Division, and others from Europe. Communication studies indicate that visual communication is the most effective in delivering the greatest impact on the human mind. Therefore, this seminar intends to maximize the use of video technology to communicate the gospel. This three-week intensive training will introduce participants to areas like video camera shooting, video editing by using computers, 
video script writing skills, interview techniques, and the use of digital graphics for purposes of evangelism. With, him, with me this afternoon here at Kirumba Stadium, I have the AGC and director who is uh, doing a fantastic job and uh, there is a video production training, uh, tra uh, training which is going on. Uh, Elder, what uh, are the concepts about this training? The purpose for our having the training program is so that we can accomplish, uh, first of all, the training of many people. The Adventist Church is a worldwide church for every nation, every culture, every language, and we want programming that comes from all of the different countries of the world, naturally including Africa. Well, that means that we have to have trained people who can produce that, and that's why we're having this video producers training program. Uh, the second objective that we have for the video producers training seminar is uh, that we can familiarize people with the equipment. Well, it is a new uh, development in video production that we can have low-cost media centers. We want to equip the churches with, those, uh, with that equipment. And so, to make people familiar, we're having the training program. And thirdly, we want to, uh, in the future, develop a program stream. We want programs that will come from the local fields that will be broadcast over Adventist World Television, AWT. And so to accomplish that goal, uh, we are having the, uh, this, the training seminar. As the program has really opened my mind and the digital technology and video production, and I'm very glad of that. Satan is going to be in greater trouble because after this program, technology will enhance our evangelism. Well, I think this uh, program is something out of this world. It's something that I cannot explain, but I think it should have come yesterday. The goal of this seminar is to produce a breed of video producers who are culturally sensitive up to date with Adventist media production standards and capable of touching human hearts with a combination of their skills and creativity to prepare them for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. song of praise for it was grace that bought my liberty I do not know just why he came to love me so he looked beyond my fault and saw my need I shall for heaven lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling. 
fault, and so my need. He looked beyond my fault, and so So join with the messengers as we sing the theme song. Amen is right. Another beautiful evening. I just wish you could all be here and enjoy this part of paradise. It is just a wonderful evening. And each night as I come out, the moon is right there. And I've been watching for it to get full. And it's just, just about full tonight. Almost a perfect evening. It's good to be with you. Great to be with you. Let me give a Zulu greeting for those in Dundee, South Africa. Sani Bona. Hope that worked. If not, in English, want to welcome you here. We're looking forward to this presentation tonight. We've had some rather heavy ones the last few nights, and I know that as I've prayed about it, some of you have heard things that have gone counter to what you have been taught before, what you have grown up with. And these are challenging when you have to wrestle with new light. And I'm sympathetic with that and want you to know that we're praying for you and the decisions that you've made. But tonight is just such a positive one that you will be blessed because we're going to be talking about so many blessings that I just can't count them. And I was pleased to hear a little bit ago one of the blessings that all of us feel from North America, from the United States, is that the United States came on tonight. And last night, the first night, they were watching uh, from back in the United States, all over the United States. So this family of ours is just getting bigger and bigger. And those of you from this area are sharing your light around the world. So now, tonight's subject holds the key to living a blessed life. Some people might even call it a charmed life. Friends, I can give my own personal testimony to the validity of what the Bible says on this topic. And the facts are, if we had time, many of you in this large stadium and in all these Down Lake sites could give your personal testimony too because the biblical principles are indeed tried and true. And so I want you to listen very carefully to some of the wonderful things that God has to say to you and to me from his word. First, listen to what he says here. I will make them and the place all around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season, and there shall be showers of blessings. Now, God simply promises to you and to me that he will bless us. How much better can it get? And God will not fail on that promise, folks. You can find case after case after case in Scripture where God was good for his word. 
Let's look at a few of these examples from Scripture by way of confidence building tonight. First, the children of Israel had gone into the land of Canaan. Joshua is now an old man. He's about to die. Read with me the words of Joshua, who had been their leader for this period of time. In Joshua 23, 14, this is what he says. Behold this day I am going the way of all the earth. He's going to die, in other words. Go to sleep, go to rest, as we talked the other night. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing, not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass, for not one word of them has failed. Ah, friends, what a testimony. Here's a man of God who has been one of God's significant leaders saying that in all these years, not one promise has failed. Now, this is talking about the man who had gone through 40 years in that desolate wilderness. He's been with those people all the way from the land of Egypt. And now he has them completely settled in the land of Canaan. And he says, you know, in your own hearts, not one word of what God has promised has ever failed. Not one. Now let's move ahead several hundred years. Nehemiah, prophet of God, has this to say, Nehemiah 9.21. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out. Their feet did not swell. Now, friends, if any of you have ever been to that wilderness, there is basically nothing there. All there is is sand. It will barely grow a weed, let alone a cow or a sheep. And Nehemiah said, you didn't lack a thing while you were there. And your feet didn't even swell from all the heat in the sand. And then this is what Solomon had to say about it in 1 Kings 8.56. Listen. Blessed be the Lord, who hath given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. Now did you know how much God blessed them in the days of Solomon? The scripture tells us that the silver in Solomon's kingdom was so common it was like stones. There has not failed one word in all his good promises which he promised through his servant Moses, Solomon said. Not one word has failed. What I'm trying to tell you tonight, friends, is that the promises in this book will not fail. If God says he will do it, he will do it. And you and I just have to learn to take what he has to say by faith and trust him. Hebrews 6, 17 says, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. If it's impossible for God to lie, and he promises something, then is he going to do it? Ah, friends, absolutely he's going to do it. So tonight, if God says, if you will do certain things, then I will bless you, you can depend on it. God won't break his promise. It will come to pass. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Jesus called his disciples, saying to them, follow me. They laid down their nets and walked away. Now, please, understand, they were leaving their work, their livelihood behind them. And don't say to me they were just poor fishermen and probably didn't have anything to lose. Because if you want to tell me that, I know you've never been to Israel. You see, they've excavated what they believe to be Peter's home. And if it was, he was not a poor fisherman. He had a very, very nice home. 
But he walked away and he left all of that. And this is what it says in Luke 22, 35. And he said to them, when I sent you without money bag or knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? And the obvious answer is they didn't lack a thing. He supplied everything. Now the story is told of an old pastor who was visiting an older member of his congregation. And as he sat down to visit with the lady, he picked up her Bible. He began to thumb through it. And as he did this, he found certain texts. And these texts, like my Bible, were underlined. But by some of those texts, she had written the letters T in English and P. So he asked her, what are these texts that have T and P beside them? And she said, this old saint, oh, those are promises of God. And the pastor said, well, that's nice. But why these letters, the T and the P, beside certain verses? And she said, oh, that means tried and proven. That's it. Friends, God's promises are tried and proven. Now, the thing that most people do not understand is simply this. Listen carefully. Listen very carefully because this is so important to our discussion. All the promises of God are conditional. Many people don't understand that. But the promises of God definitely are conditional. Tonight we're going to look at some special promises of God. We're also going to look at the condition associated with receiving that promise. You see, some people think in their hearts, well, God won't forgive me. I've been too bad. And they say, God can never forgive me. I've done so many awful things. Well, friends, Let's see what God has to say. In Deuteronomy, back in the beginning of the Bible, 11, 26 to 28, it says, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord. You see, there's the blessing. And what's the condition? The condition is, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you today. And then the curse, which is the opposite. If you do not obey the commandments of the Lord, your God. So it's simple, friends. Those are the conditions. If you fulfill the conditions, God will keep his part of the bargain. He will bless you. So tonight, can I be forgiven? Can you be forgiven no matter what you've done? And I've got to say, I've personally done a lot of bad things. I've been a rascal at times. Can I be forgiven? What do you think? Those of you there in Uppington and Lady Smith, South Africa, where it's been so cold you've had to warm up with heaters in your sights. Let's see what the condition is. The condition is found in 1 John 1, 9. Familiar verse, we know it. If we confess our sins. There's the condition. It's not hard to understand. God simply says, do you want to be forgiven, Jerry? Then here's the condition. If we confess our sins, then what's the promise? 1 John 1, 9 continuing, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's the promise. Now, do you understand these words? Faithful and just. Faithful means that heaven is open for business 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Is that clear? And just means that God's not going to treat me any different than you or you any different than me. It means that if God's going to forgive me of my sins, friends, he'll forgive you of yours. So if you want to be forgiven tonight, what do you have to do? Go to him, confess your sins, and he will forgive them. 
That is a promise that you can count on. Now you may say, well, that's fine, but I don't know that there's any hope for me. Is it possible that I could be saved after all I've done? Can I really have salvation? Well, let's see what that condition is. The conditions are not difficult to understand. Listen to what the scripture says again. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, there's the condition, not too hard, Acts 2.21, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, where's the promise? Mobutu, Mozambique, what does it say? Shall be saved. No questions. Now, do you want salvation tonight? All you have to do is call on the Lord. That's all he's asking. He that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. He promises that he will give you salvation. I want you to clearly understand that these promises are sure. They will not fail. You young people that are listening each night out there, what I share with you tonight can change your life completely and give you a blessed life, just as it can for those of any age. Let's move on. Let's talk about baptism. What's the condition there? Mark 16, 16 says, He that believes and is baptized now what's the promise it goes on it's progressive will be saved so these are simple easy promises friends all God asks you to do is just follow the conditions do you want to be saved then call on the name of the Lord be baptized like several thousands of you have been just since these meetings began those are the conditions given by God, and they're not hard ones to follow, are they? You may say, well, Dr. Potzer, that's fine, but what about my, my daily life? What about my work? What about my home? How does what you're saying relate to those everyday things? Well, let's take a look. Concerning our daily needs, food, what about food? That's about as basic as you can get. Am I going to have food on my table if I follow the Lord's condition? Matthew 6, is very clear. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the condition. Get our priorities right. Put God first, number one. Now, friends, that means in everything that you do, put God first. And if you put him first, what will happen? Let's read the promise. It goes on. And all these things shall be added to you. You say, well, what are these things the Lord will add to me? Let's read the scripture again. Matthew 6, 31 says this. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink, or what shall we wear? That tells what all these things are. God said, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live. If you seek first the kingdom of God, then he's going to take care and add all these things to you. Now, do you remember the story of Solomon? God said, King Solomon, had a dream. What would you like? I'll give you whatever you want. Wow, what an offer. And Solomon said to God, I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. God, I need wisdom to guide these people and lead them in your way. And God said, okay, Solomon, since you asked for wisdom, I won't just give you wisdom. I'll bless you. I'll give you wealth and riches untold. And he did. 
just like I said earlier, silver was as common as rocks to the people because God blessed them in Solomon's time. Now, friends, if silver was as common as rocks in Mwanza, you would all be wealthy here. But seriously, if you put God first, he will bless you. You may not understand how God's going to take care of your needs, but let me tell you something. God won't lie. It's impossible. And he's promised you. Let's go on. You say, my wife and I would love to start a family, to have our own children. You say you don't have any children. Do you realize that this too is a condition of the Bible? A condition is found in Psalm 128, 1 to 4. Listen. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his way. That's the condition. If you fear the Lord and you got to walk in his way, what is God going to do for you? What's his promise? It says if you walk in the Lord, if you follow him, if you fear the Lord, then you'll be blessed. And it goes on, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it will be well with you. And your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in your very heart of your house, and your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. There you are. God will honor your desires for a family. Think that's ever happened? Beautiful story in the Bible about a woman who had no children. She prayed. She feared the Lord. And her husband also feared the Lord. You may remember her name was Hannah. And God gave her a son by the name of Samuel. But God didn't just give her one son. But the Bible tells us that Hannah had several children. This is what she said, 1 Samuel 1.27. For this child, I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Hannah had pleaded for children. And finally, God answered her request. So if you don't have children and you want children, claim the promises and follow the conditions. It's recorded in God's word. But friends, this is probably a good point to make right here, right now, because you see, sometimes God answers our prayers in ways that we hadn't expected. He'll answer our prayer, but not always the way we expected. Let me share personally. You see, in our family, we had two sons. Darren, whom you've met. Troy, who's a business manager at one of our church secondary schools in the United States. And my wife was feeling a bit like Hannah. She wanted a daughter. And she prayed, and she prayed, and she earnestly prayed for a daughter. And you know what God did? He led us to a family, a family that lived in another country that was so poor that they could no longer keep their little baby girl. And God worked it out so that little baby girl could come and become our daughter. You see, God has a hundred ways to answer our prayers that you and, he, you and I haven't even thought about. You say, well, I'd like to get along better financially. I'd like to live better with the money that I earn. Well, there are certain conditions here, too. And unfortunately, the conditions are not the way the world thinks, and it may not be the way that you've always thought. If you're going to think like the world, it won't work. <laughs> because you know what one of the first condition is to being blessed financially? Have any idea what it may be? The condition of the Bible is if you want to be blessed financially, then you have to give. What do you mean by give? You may be saying it's simple. Give. That's right. If you want to do well financially as far as God's blessings for you are concerned, then you have to give. And if you don't give, you're selfish. And God will not bless you. 
Let's take a look. Ishaka, Uganda. These are the conditions, Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. That's the condition. Do you want to see what the blessing is? This is what he promises. Good measure, it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will it be put into your bosom? Bible goes on, for the same measure that you have used it, it will be measured back to you. And I can tell you right now, you can't be selfish and receive the blessings of God. Do you understand? Does this make sense? Giving is the law of heaven. And if you want to be blessed financially, you have to learn how to give. And that's just one of the points. There are some other points to consider when wanting to be blessed financially. The Sabbath. You probably didn't realize that the Sabbath had a part to play in financial blessing, did you? But it does. If you want to be blessed, you need to keep the seventh day Sabbath. At least, at least that's what the scripture says. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Listen carefully. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, that means if you quit keeping the Sabbath holy from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. It's talking about here again, secular activities, worldly talk, the things that we talk about and do during the week. Those were the conditions. And then here's the promise. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob. Your father for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's the promise. Not the mouth of this speaker, but the mouth of the Lord. And that's a promise. And you may say tonight, wherever you're seated in this vast, vast congregation all around the world, is that really, really true? Let me share you another story. It's one that a friend told me. This is what he, what he said. He had a friend. He passed away several years ago now. But according to this friend, his friend was a very unusual character. In fact, he said perhaps the most unusual person that he'd ever known. He was a man of very short stature. In fact, my friend said he was very wide, too, if you know what I mean. Well, that friend was driving down the road one day, and he noticed a fellow beside the road. The other fellow was very tall and very skinny, and he was hitchhiking. At least that's what we call it in the United States. When you try to get a ride without paying for it, he had his thumb out. That's the sign in America. He was asking for a ride. Well, the short, fat friend pulled his car over, and the hitchhiker got in. Now, he had a suitcase, and my friend's friend said to him, put your suitcase in the back seat. So he put the suitcase in the back seat. And while they were driving down the road and talking, he asked the man, what do you do, sir, for a living? Oh, said the tall, skinny man, I sell Bibles. The friend asked, you do what? He said, I sell Bibles. The friend replied, I am so glad to meet somebody who sells Bible. That must be a wonderful work. And they talked for a while, and the friend asked him, Do you believe the Bible? As he drove down the road. Oh, he said, I believe it from cover to cover. I believe every word in the Bible. The friend said, That's great. I'm so glad to meet somebody who believes in God's word, selling God's word. That's a great work. You know, he went on, I believe what the Bible says, my heart responds to it. 
As he drove, he said, I'm looking forward to when Jesus is coming back in the clouds of heaven. How do you feel about Jesus coming back? Oh, the hitchhiker replied, I don't believe Jesus is coming back in the clouds of heaven. I don't believe anything like that. I believe he just comes back into your mind or into your heart. This thing about him coming back in a person, I can't believe all that. And the friend said to him, do you have any of those Bibles with you? He said, oh yeah, in my suitcase. And the friend said, then get one out. The fellow brought out one of his Bibles. And the friend said, open it to John, the 14th chapter, and read verses 1 to 3. And he turned over to John 14, that verse we quoted the other night. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He said, now, turn over to Acts 1.11, where it says, he'll come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And he read that. And then he said, now turn over there to Revelation, the first chapter, and read verse 7, where it says concerning the coming of Jesus, that every eye shall see him. And the man read that. And then he said, now turn over to Matthew 24 and read verse 27, where it says, as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And he turned over and he read that. And he said, now turn over there and read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, where it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And he had him read these verses. And then the friend asked, now what do you believe? And the tall, skinny hitchhiker said, you're messing me up. That's not the way I was taught. And the friend pulled his car off to the side of the road and said, then get out. And the fellow said, what do you mean, get out? And the friend said, you sell Bibles? You told me you believed in them from cover to cover, and we just read all these texts about Jesus coming back, and you refuse to believe it? Well, I'm not going to haul somebody around who sells Bibles and doesn't believe it. And the fellow said, well, well, maybe, maybe I could believe it. And so they started down the road, driving down the road. After a little while, the friend asked again, you believe your Bible? And he said, yes, I believe the Bible. I told you before, I believe it's the word of God. And the friend said, how do you feel about the seventh day Sabbath? God's holy day. Oh, he said, I don't keep the Sabbath. I don't believe that at all. My friend said, get out that Bible. Open it there to Genesis. Second chapter, read verses 2 and 3, where it says that God blessed and hallowed and sanctified the seventh day. Then he said, now turn over to Exodus, the 20th chapter, and read verses 8 to 11, where it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And he read the commandment about the Sabbath. And then he said, now turn over there to Isaiah 66 and read verse 22 and 23 where it says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, speaking of heaven, all flesh shall come before me, says the Lord. And then he said, now read Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, and read verse 12 and verse 20 where it says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. Then he said, now turn over there to Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 16, where it says that it was Jesus' custom to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he read that. And then the friend said, now turn over to Mark, the second chapter, read verse 27, 28, where Jesus said that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he read that. And then he said, now turn over there to Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in verse 9, where it says, there still remains the keeping of the Sabbath 
for the people of God. The tall, skinny men read that. And he read all these texts about the Sabbath while they were driving along. And he said, now what do you believe? And he said, oh, I can't believe that. I just can't accept that. So the friend pulled off to the side of the road again and said, get out. And he said, wait, you don't understand. My friend said, what do you mean? I don't understand. He said, I sell more Bibles on Saturday than any other day of the week. And if I don't sell Bibles on Saturday, I'd starve to death. And the friend said, get out. And the fellow got out of the car. And the friend got out of the car with him. And he walked around the other side of the car where the fellow was, and he said, now, friend, you're telling me that if you didn't sell Bibles on Saturday, you'd starve to death? Now, friend, you're tall and skinny and don't keep the Sabbath, and I'm short and fat, and you're trying to tell me you'd starve to death? Well... The hitchhiker got the message. He saw the point, and I hope you do as well. You see, friends, there is a blessing in keeping God's holy Sabbath. And God says, I will bless you if you'll keep it. And it won't fail. It never has, and it never will. There's one other conditional promise that I'd like to look at tonight. It's regarding the subject of tithing. If you want to be blessed by God, we're told to return to him what is his. This is what he says there in Malachi 3, 10, and 11. These are the conditions. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. That's the condition. Try me now, he's saying. Bring the tithe to the storehouse. And God says, I will bless you. And by the way, folks, this is the only promise that I know of where God comes right out and says, if you don't believe me, try me. What will God do if you do it? Here's what he says as verse 10 goes on. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You see, God says, if you'll return the tithe to me, the storehouse, not just set it aside and spend it as you want, the storehouse into the church, I will bless you until there won't be room enough for you even to receive those blessings. And there are people who say, but we're heavily in debt. We don't have any money. What we need to do is get out of debt first. I want to say to you tonight, if you don't have any money, or even if you're worse than that, you're in debt, the first thing to get out of debt is to begin returning the tithe. If you want to get out of debt, return an honest tithe. That's a promise God gives, and he won't fail. He never will. He never has, and he certainly won't for you. Now, here are some of the promises. Listen, he's going to pour you out a blessing, and there will not be room enough to receive it. Verse 11 says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, friends, what's a tithe? A tithe is one-tenth. That just simply means that if you make 1,000 shillings, then a tithe of that is 100 shillings. If you make $100, tithe is $10. Just one-tenth. That's what the tithe is. Let me tell you a little secret tonight. Personally, I would much rather have nine-tenths and have God's blessing than have ten-tenths 
and not have his blessing. One time a pastor was speaking on the subject of tithing, and a fellow came up to him after, after he'd finished preaching, and he said, you know, you don't have to give your tithe to be saved. And the pastor said, how do you figure that? And he said, well, the thief on the cross never paid any tithe, and he's going to be saved. And the pastor thought for a moment. He said, well, guess, I guess you're right. But there's one difference between you and the thief on the cross. Oh, the man said, what's that? And the pastor replied, he was a dying thief, and you're a living thief. Now, there's a big difference, friends, and you don't want to be a living thief. No, God will not fail. Leviticus 27.30 says, And all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Now, folks, when God makes something holy, we've talked about that before with this pulpit over here. And from that day on, it's not yours anymore to do with as you please. And this is what people don't understand about the Sabbath. Nowhere in this book does it say that the Sabbath is just yours. It doesn't say that. Every place in this book, it says the Sabbath of the Lord, not the Sabbath of man. It was made for man, that's true. But it's still the Lord's Sabbath. It's the Lord's. It's not yours. It's the same thing with the tithe. It is the Lord's. It is not yours. It was made for your benefit, but it's not yours to spend as you please. It has been made holy. Therefore, you and I are to return to him what is his. Bible says one-tenth of our income and one-seventh of our time. These are God's. Now what happens if we're faithful? You remember that old story of Jacob and Genesis 27, 30, way back in the beginning of the Bible? You may remember how he had stolen his brother's blessing, and Esau was so mad he said, when our father dies, Jacob... I am going to kill you. And so the Bible records how Jacob fled down to his uncle Laban's house, got out on the plains of Bethel, and there tired and worried, afraid of his brother, and he fell asleep one night. During the night, he had a dream where he saw a heavenly stairway. He saw angels coming up and going down and going up and coming down. And the next morning when he got up, he said, this, this must be the house of the Lord. And there Jacob made a commitment to God. So I want you to listen to that commitment. It's found in Genesis 28, verse 22. It says, of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Jacob made that commitment to God that night. And he went on down to his uncle Laban's house, and he stayed there quite a little while. If you remember the story, his uncle Laban had two daughters, one by the name of Leah and one by the name of Rachel. And the scripture says that Rachel was beautiful, but Leah evidently wasn't as pretty, might have been considered rather homely. As could be expected, Jacob fell in love with Rachel, the pretty one. And Jacob went to her father, Laban, and said, what do I have to do? to marry your daughter. And his uncle Laban was just as conniving as Jacob had been, and he said, oh, if you'll work for me for seven years, I'll give you my daughter. And Jacob was so madly in love with her, he said, okay, I'll do it. And so he worked for him for seven long years. And he went to him and he said, I've worked for you for seven years, and now I want to marry your daughter. Laban said, fine, let's have a wedding. So they had the wedding. Of course, as you know, in those countries there, back then, they wore veils over their faces. 
And he had a wedding. And when Jacob got his bride home and took the veil off, lo and behold, he had Leah and not Rachel. And he grabbed her by the hand and he took poor Leah back to his, her father and he said, listen, I worked for seven years for Rachel, not for her. Laban said, well, I'm sorry, but here in this country, it's our custom. The oldest daughter has to marry first. I'll tell you what, you work for me for seven more years and I'll give you rest. So that's what Jacob did. Now, folks, I want you to get something very clear here. He had worked for Laban for 14 years, and his total pay was these two women. And then Laban called him in one day and said, Jacob, if you're going to stay here, I guess I really need to be paying you something more. I'll tell you what, Jacob. I'll give you any of the animals that are born spotted, any cattle that are spotted, any sheep that are spotted, any goats that are spotted. I'll give those to you, and I'll keep the solid-colored ones, the ones that are all one color. That wasn't too great a deal since all of Laban's cattle and sheep and goats were all one color. But Jacob didn't have much of a choice, and so he said, all right, that's a deal. But you know, he had been paying tithe, and God blessed him. And Jacob, when he watched that spring, when the cattle were calving, they were spotted. All of them were spotted. And Laban came running out there and said, what in the world's going wrong here? What is happening? All these animals are now spotted. And Jacob said, I don't know what's happening. And the next year, the cattle were all spotted again. And Laban called him in and said, Jacob, I've been thinking about this. I'll tell you what. I'm going to keep all the spotted ones, and you can have all those solid-colored ones. And Jacob said, okay. And you know what happened? He had been faithful again to keep his promise. And God was keeping him, and he blessed Jacob again. And this time, the animals were born solid-colored animals. All of them. You can read it right there, folks. It's in the Bible. And he stayed for seven more years, and he left Laban's house, an extremely wealthy man. Why? That story is in the Bible partially because it's there for us to learn that God keeps his word. I return to God one-tenth of whatever he gives to me, Jacob had said. And God blessed him for it. I want to make something clear. It is possible to pay tithe and to live an ungodly life. Don't misunderstand me. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he said to the scribes and Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Now, those are the very smallest means of exchange that they had back then. In other words, these Pharisees, these scribes, were hypocrites. They were very careful about paying their tithe. And Christ said in Matthew 23, 23, but they have neglected the weightier matters of the law of justice and mercy and faith, those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So Christ made it very clear that you and I are to return our tithe to the storehouse. But in addition to that, we are also to have justice, and mercy, and faith. And all of those must come together. And so if you do, friends, we'll take seriously these potential blessings that I've shared with you tonight. And if you follow those conditions, you will live a blessed life. No question about it. Deuteronomy 28.2 says, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obeyed the voice of the Lord your God. Then, after the Lord has given you all of this, then you know what else he's going to do? Matthew 25.34 tells us, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God's saying, listen, I'm going to bless you. Bless you on that old earth. 
But when this whole world comes to an end, he's going to say, come, you've blessed them. Those of you that I've blessed, inherit the kingdom. Not only have I blessed you and cared for you there on this earth, I'll give you a blessing throughout all of eternity. These are some of the marvelous promises, friends, that God gives to you if you will simply follow him. Listen to this appeal song. Jesus, I love you more than silver. Jesus, I love you more than silver. Silver that nailed you to the cross. I'll not forsake you. Thank you, Benny. Great song, great message. Jesus, I love you more than silver. Tonight we've been talking about stewardship, about giving back to God, back to Him what's really His. One seventh of his, our time that's really His, one tenth of our income that's really His, tithe, Sabbath, and then he'll bless us for being faithful to his word. Tonight I want to just challenge you in a general call. Have a talk about that seventh of your time, the Sabbath that we talked about the other night, two nights. Maybe you've not been totally honest with the tithe, returning it to the storehouse, again, which is the church, so it can be dispersed out to spread the gospel around the world. Or if you just want to say, yes, I've experienced those blessings. I can testify that God is true to his word. Whatever category you may fall into, if you'd like to commit yourself to be blessed, to follow his conditions through his power and his grace and his help, then I'd invite you to stand to your feet while Benny sings that verse one more time and then we'll pray together stand to your feet in commitment to these principles that we've talked about from God's Word Jesus I love you more than silver silver that nailed you to Forsake you for that silver, silver that nailed you to the cross. For the love of silver, Judas sold a friend. For the love of silver. Someone may do the same again. Jesus, I love you more than silver, silver that nailed you.
tomorrow night, another important message, one that you must hear, one that is something we've talked about a little bit before. When we talk about the importance of God speaking to us and through special means so that we can understand his word, there is incredible opportunity, opportunities for counterfeits. And they abound. The Bible tells us that even the elect may be deceived. And tomorrow's program will help guarantee that you won't be deceived. We want you to come back then. But before you leave, before we go tonight, I want to pray with you to solidify this commitment that we've made. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your holy word that we've looked at tonight. Thank you for the promises that you have made to bless us abundantly. And we can testify to the fact that you do keep your word. Tonight there are those who may have stepped out in faith in either this area of Sabbath keeping and one seventh of their time and giving it back to you or maybe in the area of their finances giving back the one tenth that's already yours Lord give them the courage to follow through because the devil will tempt them and then bless them for doing that as you've blessed so many of us years gone by and now be with each one Give them a safe trip home. Bring them back to the same place tomorrow night. We love you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tomorrow night, should I consult a psychic? We'll be right here. And I trust you will be as well. Good night. God bless.